Okay, welcome everyone to Free Thought Blogs Conscience FTBCon 3. It is 4.01 p.m. So it has Sunday, January 25th. We are one minute late going live. <laughs> um, I am going to be taking Q&A for this panel, which is Teaching Critical Thinking. Uh, and uh, I'm also going to try to play moderator and keep people from, you know, being silent about this. Uh, so, uh, first off, I guess I'd like uh, I'd like people to introduce yourselves, and since we're just going to go from left to right on my Hangouts order, uh, let's start with Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah Messinger. I teach math to high school students in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I also blog at The Merely Real, um, and i am just been involved in skeptical and secular uh, conferences and communities for a while, and I this is really my first time getting to combine those two loves, so I'm really excited. Okay, Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself and your cat? <laughs> uh, I'm Dan Linford. Um, I am a, uh, I'm a philosophy professor at um, Thomas Nelson Community College in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, and you can find me online at danlinford.wordpress.com. That's D-A-N-L-I-N-F-O-R-D. Great. Uh, and yourself, Matt. Hi. Uh, my name's Matt Lowry. Um, and I'm known online as the Skeptical Teacher right there. Uh, if you go to uh, skepticalteacher.org, you can see my blog where I news about topics related to uh, science, skepticism, education, and so on. Uh, in my day job when I'm not blogging uh, or doing skeptic stuff, I am a high school and college physics professor. Okay, so uh, now that we know who everybody is, uh, since you, Matt, uh, were, as far as I know, the person who put together this panel, uh, no, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, it was Hannah, wasn't it? It was Hannah. Okay. I'm not going to give credit. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to try to give credit appropriately. Hana. I'll take credit. That's okay. <laughs> I honestly was just going to let it slide. I was just going to be like, talk good, whatever. <laughs> Tell us why you put this uh, this panel together and uh, what your intents were and what we'd like to talk about. Sure. Uh, I think as a movement, secular, atheist, skeptical, whatever, um, we're interested in a lot of things that are outside the traditional specter of what a movement like this is about. Um, and one of the things that we care a lot about is education and also about how we create more secular people, um, or at least how to improve what rationalists call the sanity waterline, um, the general critical thinking abilities of the general populace. Uh, and I thought it would be great not just to hear from kind of lay people, but from experts so to speak, not that I consider myself an education expert, but people who are on the front line, so to speak, of interacting with young people. Um, some of us are still young people. Um, but of, of bringing our deep and abiding uh, uh, values about critical thinking into our day jobs and how that affects the future. That was my yeah. hope. As a lay person here, uh, and less than young as it stands, uh, what I'm getting out of that is how do we expand our mission? How do we convert the heathens to our cause? Is that about right? Um, something like that. But I mean, I don't, I don't know that I want any of my students to graduate high school thinking, God, I'm so glad I'm an atheist because of Miss Messinger. Um, <laughs> That's like not what I want them to put in my yearbooks. But if any of them ever said, um, you taught me a new way to think, and I did get a card last summer that said just that, which was more important to me than anything else. Yeah, I have to, I have to really want to dovetail on what, uh, what Hannah's saying there. Because, um, yeah, as, as I tell my colleagues and, and others when I'm at skeptical events such as this, I, I'm not, I'm not going to fool myself into thinking that I'm going to have a whole bunch of uh, little James Randys walk out of my classroom at the end of the year or something like that, and, and that's not my goal. Uh, my goal is just to, try, like, like she said, just to just to try to get my students to 
think a, a, a bit more deeply about, uh, you know, when they hear an extraordinary claim, like, you know, oh, there's this funny light in the sky, so it must be an alien spacecraft, right? You know, get them maybe to think, well, what is that really? What could it be? And so on and so forth. Um, and uh, if I can if I can do that, you know, and I, and I can kind of plant that seed of, uh, of doubt and uh, that, that, that seed of critical thinking in their mind, uh, that, that's that's a big win for me. So that's how I look at it. Yeah, I mean, my approach is similar. Um, I mean, so in my, I teach introductory ethics. And in introductory ethics, there's really three things that I'm trying to convey to my students. Uh, first are various logical skills. These are skills about um, how to reason and how not to reason. Uh, and second are paper writing skills. You know, most students don't actually come into college with the ability to write a college-level argumentative essay. Uh, and then third, um, I present to them representative ethical theories so that they have something to actually argue about. I think that's what we do in education in general, right, is that we, we present to them various skills, but then we also present to them content uh, that they can use those skills to evaluate. Okay, yeah. so to bring it back around to what I was saying earlier, but not as cynical. It's more about teaching critical thinking skills than expecting that everybody is going to think the way that you expect them to. So teach them how to think, not what to think. Oh, yeah. Right? right. Yeah, exactly. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't like to I, I wouldn't like to put my students in a position where they feel like they have to uh, you know, accept what I say just because you know, I'm the teacher, right? You know, that that's that's actually something you don't want to do, in my opinion, because that's uh, that's reinforcing the uh, the old logical fallacy of the argument of the argument from authority. And so, the more you get them to reason through things on their own and and, and so on, I think it's better. Well, you know, I tell my students uh, that in philosophy, it's possible to be intelligently incorrect. That is, that they can have good arguments for false conclusions. <laughs> And then I'm really, what I'm evaluating uh, them on is their ability to produce arguments to back up what they're saying, but not really on the basis of whatever it is that they conclude. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've actually had times where I've uh, been grading a student's exam, for example, and if it's a question where maybe they have to do a calculation or, or they have to have a written argument and they... If, they may have a, a wrong premise or something, but if they if they actually follow the logic and the reasoning properly, then you know they they, they can actually do okay. Um, it's it's you know it's not so much always getting the right answer as it is you know, what is your chain of logic, what is your reasoning to get from point A to point B. How did yeah. you find it that uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. Happy to jump in. Um yeah, I I actually do this Almost to an extreme, um, one of the, the catchphrases, I suppose, I use in my classroom is, like, numbers don't matter, um, which is not a thing that people expect math teachers to say. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is, I almost never give points based on the correct numerical answer, because, like, kids are doing all of these complicated um, integrals, or they're looking at domain and range. I don't know, words that I'm sure are scaring off half our audience. But um, <laughs> like maybe in like the sixth step, they added 3 and 8 and got 10. And so their answer is like off by however much. But I, I often give full credit to those solutions, especially if they can explain to me why they did the work that they did. OK. Um, so you're teaching the process more so than the end result. That seems counterintuitive with the, yeah. uh, the expectations of and I guess this is maybe talking more to the academic standards, um, but when it comes to testing, they expect you to get the correct end result, and there pretty much is only one correct result for a math problem. Um, do you find that that poses any difficulty, teaching them how to think as opposed to how to come up with the correct answer? Um, yes and no. I think that um, it's one of those skills that you learn as a teacher when you're grading, and I'm sure that... Matt especially can speak to this as a physics teacher, but also Dan, um, which is why did they get the answer wrong, right? Did they get the answer wrong because they understand everything and failed to add 3 and 8? Or did they get the answer wrong because um, they can't find a common denominator? And even though that's not what I'm testing, that's still a core skill that they need to have. 
or did they get the answer wrong because they fundamentally misunderstood a concept that we've gone over in class that they need to know for this test? And my grading is supposed to assess, uh, is supposed to give different grades based on my answer to that question. Um, and I think that that conception is a little bit wrong. So for instance, in the SAT, right, you have to get the right answer because it's multiple choice for almost all of it um, in the math section. But the wrong answers are almost never answers that you could get just by doing something stupid. Excuse me. Making a silly error. I shouldn't say that. Um, but making a silly error like 3 plus 8 is 11. Then you just won't get an answer that's one of the five, right? They trick you by putting answers that you would get if you followed the wrong chain of reasoning. And similarly, on an AP test, yeah, you'll get one point off if your answer is wrong. But you get most of your points on free response questions from the process. So yeah. um, I actually, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, very much the same experience. And uh, and uh, I like like she says, uh, says I, I would. Uh, I have many occasions where you know I'm grading, I'm marking papers or something, and I give a student uh, most of the points. Um, and because if they if they if they can show me their work, that's what I'm, I'm really big on that. You know, you show me your work because if I can pinpoint where the error is, if it is a silly mistake, uh, then you know the, you're not going to lose a lot of points or anything. Um, I I also want to kind of mention that in, in scenarios where students are you know focused on getting the right answer, so to speak, it is possible to get the right answer but for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I have uh, I've seen situations in grading physics uh, tests or, or problems where a student does get their right answer, but when I look through how they worked it, they they used a completely invalid method, and they just kind of got lucky. And I and they they lose points for that because it's like okay, well you did quote get the right answer, but. If I just change the numbers around a little bit, or it was a slightly different scenario, you don't know how to reason your way through it, and that's a problem. So it does it does really ultimately go back to that that whole point of being able to reason your way through the the, the whatever the situation is, whether it's a you know, philosophical argument or a mathematics problem or uh, or or analyzing a piece of literature or whatever. I'm actually super curious where Dan falls on this because I think in like physics and math, um, I never run the risk of going too far in the other direction. Like no one ever doubts that the right answer is important in math. <laughs> I have to convince them only of the opposite. But I imagine that for Dan maybe like some people go so far that they're like, well, you know, I reason through it. So any conclusion is reasonable. Yeah. So I like Dan say anything. Um, there is a, a question in the chat room that actually dovetails perfectly with this. So I want to make sure that it's explicitly acknowledged, and yeah. then we can pattern the answer to it. Uh, how important do the panelists think it is to hone critical thinking for students to argue positions they disagree with, e.g. Dan, or find problems with answers they think are right, e.g. Hannah? So that actually works perfectly. So Dan, go ahead. So my undergrad was actually in physics. Uh, and before I, did phys before I did philosophy grad school, I was in a physics PhD program. Um, where I was a physics TA, so I've, I've taught physics and mathematics, and I've also tutored calculus. Um, so I've seen really both worlds, uh, at least in some, on some level. And what that then meant was that when I started teaching philosophy, uh, the first thing I wanted to figure out was how can I teach philosophy in a way where I can grade similarly to how I used to grade when I was a physics TA. Um, so that was part of the mentality that went into how I designed class. At, at the same time, though, all of their all of their tests and their homeworks, they're all essays. Uh, they're all writing assignments. So what I tried to do was this impossible task of like figuring out how to take writing assignments and then turn them into something like physics problem sets. Uh, but ultimately, when you're doing a physics problem set, you're doing something like um, something like an essay, especially in heritable classes where you might have like a, you know, you, you end up with your, your solutions being a 20 page response to a problem set. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, what I'm checking for are similar things I'm checking for if they're following the, the right logical steps, are they using the techniques that I've taught them in class, 
uh, are they evaluating the material that I asked them to evaluate in using the tools that I gave them to evaluate that material. At the same time, I'm also asking them to evaluate uh, counter positions. And I guess this is something that might differ from a, phys a physics class, is that I'll have them routinely include in their essays a section where they look at alternative points of view or objections to the argument that they're presenting. Um, but then again, even in those sections, I, I try to enforce a really methodical grading scheme where I want I want to see this number of objections. I want to see them using these kinds of techniques to make those objections. Uh, but then the content, what they actually do there, um, is is up to them. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I like you said what you said, Dan, about your background and everything, because uh, I'm actually kind of the reverse. I, I'm a physics <laughs> professor, and uh, I'm actually working on my uh, my degree in philosophy right now. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and it is kind of nice having a foot in each world, so to speak, because um, my my uh, my coursework in philosophy and, and learning all of that has actually helped inform. And it's changed, I think, for the better how I teach physics. Because even even though you know, like 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 we've said, you know, there are correct answers in mathematics and physics and so on. Uh, on occasion, I will um, I will challenge my students in a in, in a in a little bit of a sort of a Socratic way, I suppose, uh, where I try to engage them in some kind of dialogue. And every now and then, I try to I will try to get them to go in the wrong direction towards a wrong conclusion and see mm. if they can catch mm. me at it. And uh, it's very interesting to, uh, to, try to, to try to work those two sort of methodologies together. Um, it's tough, though. It, 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 it isn't easy. Ken, it seems like you risk um, undercutting the lesson that you were trying to, trying to give if you intentionally took them down the garden path. But um, Hannah, do you have oh, any... I, yeah, you have to be very careful how you do it. Because <laughs> if you do it wrong, it, it does mess up everything. So, yeah. Hannah, how about uh, when when students find that they are disagreeing with a concrete answer that they think is right but isn't? I just I wish that happened more often. Um, I don't, my students don't disagree with me that often. Um, one thing that's nice, so um, for freshmen and sophomores, at, uh, the school I teach at, we use an inquiry-based curriculum. So the students do problems at home and present the solutions to each other. Um, I don't lecture, and I don't present slides, and I don't, I, I'm, I'm not, in theory, the focal point of the classroom. Um, in practice, of course, sometimes I go up to the board and I help out. But anyway, so what that, what that means is that the students get to disagree with each other. And what I try to cultivate as much as possible is when someone at the board who is presenting a problem says something that someone else thinks is wrong, I want student B to challenge student A, not to turn to me. And, and I swear to god, high school students are like expert facial analysts. They like know <laughs> what face I make when something's wrong versus if something's almost right. Like, it's amazing. Like, I'll ask them, like, oh, that's such an interesting point. Why did you think that? And they're like, oh, because when I started talking, you made a face. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I guess that's of critical thinking. Like, definitely some life skills yeah. being taught here. Oh. Dogs uh, and cats can read your facial expressions. <laughs> you should be able to, you too. <laughs> right, but, like, I try to keep a poker face. It doesn't happen. Anyway, so what I always do or try to do is when they look at me and they give me that expectant look, I say, like, I just point at the person at the board. I'm like, go talk to them. Like, they're presenting. Um, and <laughs> Fight. Like, I'm just, just like, just go. I'm not, like, they're looking at me. Like, I'm going to fix it. Like, I'm not presenting. <laughs> this is not me. <laughs> this is not my problem. Sometimes I literally will just, like, look away so they can't make eye contact with me. Eye contact is killer. It ends everything. I just go like this. Anyway, um, and sometimes, and I'd love to hear more from other people about like, you know, we have all of these high-minded ideas. The question is, of course, how well it works. And so I have a class in which it works okay, about half and half, but I have a class in which like it has become very normal that when someone at the board says something that a lot of the class thinks is wrong, they all argue about it for a couple minutes. It's great. Yeah. Um, and I try to encourage it. Sorry, go for it. No, go on, go on. 
Oh, I just I try to encourage well, it I, even when one side is sort of obviously wrong. Who cares? Yeah. Especially when one side is wrong yeah, in like an interesting way. <laughs> no, I try to. Uh, no, no. I, I try to do something similar in 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 my classes, in my physics classes. Like I said before, it's very difficult to kind of do that in, a, in, a, in, a, in sort of the quantitative science setting, but you can if you're creative. Um, one way I try to do it is in some lab work that I do. As you know, they're making measurements, doing calculations. There are questions as as as, as they go through lab, kind of, some, kind of some leading questions, and every now and then. Uh, it's very interesting that by the nature of the question, it causes uh, students within lab groups to kind of argue back and forth a bit. And sometimes they'll they'll get to an impasse, and uh, they'll call me and say, "Oh, you know, I say this, and so and so says this. So who's right?" And and uh, and I try to avoid in those circumstances giving them the correct answer, so to speak. But what I try to do is I try to refer them back to what they did earlier in the lab and say, okay, well, what did you see back here? You, you did back here. See what you're looking at here and see if you can you know, kind of make sense of that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just got done doing a lab earlier this week on, uh, on, on Archimedes' principle and buoyancy. And uh, they, uh, there, there was actually quite a bit of that back and forth going on. You know, I, I had kids calculating, for example, that this uh, a little a little ball that was floating in in this in this uh, graduated cylinder. You know, they were doing things like calculating. Oh, the density is 2.1 grams per milliliter. Uh, of course, if you know anything about the density of water, that's a problem. <laughs> <because> yes. <laughs> anything that's got a greater density is going to sink. And there 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 and, and there were students within the group kind of going, I don't know if that makes sense. Like, well, I just want to go on the calculator and Mr. Lowry come over so I took a look at it and I'm like, okay, <laughs> now let's go back and think about this a little bit. And then they were like, Oh yeah, okay. So but another way to do this, and this is this is really cool. I, I can't claim credit for this, I totally stole it from a colleague, but exactly what Han is talking about with the uh, with getting them to really putting them in a position where they really have to argue together, I, I liken it to you know you throw a couple of ants into the, the jar, the glass jar, and you shake it up to watch them fight. Um, when I give in class exams, uh, the way that my students set the curves is they're completely responsible for setting the curve, and so I create a scenario where I hand back the the test questions uh, and I break them up into groups, and each group is responsible for a certain number of questions, and they have to argue within their groups what they think their answers are. And then everybody comes back together, and like group one goes up to the board and says, "We think our answer to number one is this, and here's why. And we think the answer to number two is this, and here's why. And if there's any students out in the rest of the class that disagrees, they have to object, and then the whole class argues it out, and they're not allowed to proceed until they come as a group, as a class, to a consensus on what's the answer for a certain question. And the more questions in that process that they get correct, they uh, they get a better curve. So yeah, the pro the correct answer is so important. So cool. <laughs> that is really cool. In that environment where they argue with each other. Yeah, and I totally cannot claim credit for this. I did not admit this. I stole it from a colleague who has since retired. Uh, I don't know where he got the idea. It's an amazing idea. It works wonderfully at all quick, levels of classwork that I do. Um, quick I plug for teaching as a profession. Chatting. You get to steal everything from everyone else, and no one cares. <laughs> Standing in the transition of giants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question from yeah, the, the, the uh, saying. Sorry, Go on. I have a question from the IRC channel, okay. um, and this this sounds like it's going to be mostly up Dan's alley, but I'd like to hear all three of your your answers for it. Um, <clears throat> what is your opinion about constructivist teaching, having students construct their own knowledge, sort of the op opposite of knowledge transmission? Um, well, I I mean I have to confess I, that I'm not familiar with the terminology here, but the, um, you know, my background's not in education, it's in philosophy and physics, but, uh, but, I, you know, I, I think it's, it is really important for me for students to reach their own conclusions, um, but I would put it more in terms of they're having their own inquiries, um, so the kind of inquiry-based instruction that Hannah was talking about, uh, that's really what I, what I have them do in their uh, in, in their weekly assignments and in their midterm and their final exam, these are all written assignments, they're all essays. And they're supposed to investigate an argument of their choice. Um, of course, that's related to the topic of the course, but they have to investigate this argument of their choice and then 
to defend that argument or to reject that argument using what they've researched. In that sense, they're sort of constructing for themselves what they think about this thing. Uh, but I don't know that I would... I, I don't know enough about what it means to have um, construction-based instruction to say whether or not that would actually count as that or not. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure myself. It, it kind of seems as though it's something where you give them the framework within which they were supposed to work and let them build from there. Just give yeah, them like, the yeah, bare basics I mean, and... So you know, I, Here's a bunch of Legos, play with them. So my approach is that I'm, you know, I'm giving them, on the one hand, skills about essay writing, about critical thinking. On the other hand, I'm also giving them um, the various various topics, um, various theories, to, in order to apply those skills. But in so doing, my role in presenting at least the theoretical portion of the course, where I give them like, you know, ethical theory, is to sort of be a neutral moderator, neutral presenter of those theories. Of course, in principle, it's kind of impossible to actually be a neutral presenter of anything. Uh, but what I strive for is to have the way in which the presentation is biased is biased not towards what I think the right answer is, but towards what's most pedagogically useful. So for instance, one of the first units that we go through is on uh, religion-based theories of ethics, so things like divine command theory. Not because I think those are right, uh, but because a lot of the things that we see later on in the course can already be presented in the context of that theory. And all of my students come in, well, not all my students, but many of my students come into the class already understanding some things about religion and ethics in that context. So in order to present them with that material early on in a situation where they already understand a lot of the things that are going on, um, makes course material later on make a lot more sense. Okay. Do either of you... Uh, Hana, Matt. Yeah, um, I'll jump in on this a little bit. Um, when it comes to various uh, sort of learning methodologies and pedagogical theories and so on, um, I, I, the way I do it is I tend not to uh, put all of my eggs in one basket, so to speak, you know, because some some educational theorists say, you know, oh, the constructive approach is the way to do it, and, and so on. Um, I try to do things in a variety of ways because um, I want I want my students to be able to um, I want them to be able to think in a variety of different ways and these different kinds of teaching methodologies emphasize different aspects of that thinking. Now, in terms of the constructivist approach, kind of like what what Dan was talking about, actually uh, this week I just in one of my classes I just got done doing something like this, but you know, when you talk about the inquiry-based learning that kind of sometimes dovetails with constructivist type approaches and, and, and similar ideas, um, I think sometimes you have to be really careful about that because uh, some people, you know, they kind of look at inquiry-based learning as just, oh, it's just completely open-ended. Um, and that can be uh, interesting and useful in certain contexts, but in some contexts, like, for example, if we're talking about trying to study like we did this week, electrostatics, uh, electrostatic phenomena. Um, electrostatic phenomena are very, very tricky. And if you just kind of make it a completely open in an endeavor, the, the students can sit there for weeks and weeks and never really figure it out <laughs> or get maybe a little bit, but then they miss all this other stuff. So depending upon what it is you're trying to study, you may have to give them a little bit of guidance. Uh, so, so what I did is I, is I gave them what I call the, the, the basic principles of charge particle theory. And you know, I said, we're going we're gonna to assume these principles, uh, and we're going to work within that framework, within that context. And then they had a couple of days to kind of inquire and play around with the phenomena and make notes and, and observations. And then we kind of came back together and tried to talk our way through this and make sense out of the whole thing. Um, so it, it, it can be good, um, but sometimes, depending upon the scenario, you may have to provide a little structure or a little guidance, because otherwise you do run the risk if you just go straight inquiry-based, you know, in its idealized state, you, you run the risk of, you know, 
going down blind alleys and rabbit holes and, and all kinds of things. So it's a useful tool in your kit, but it's not necessarily one that you'd try to apply to every single problem. Right, it is, it is. It is. It's 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 a, it's a tool. It's not the tool. Yeah, I, I'm totally on board with that, especially because this is one of my favorite topics. That's what the research says. Um, uh, when I got this job, I got really, really obsessed with education research um, because I wanted to do my job better, and um, I can find the paper or whatever, but there's a couple of papers on um, minimal input teaching, like where the teacher doesn't do a lot of direct instruction. Um, and when you do it, it's an incredibly valuable tool, but when you do it entirely on its own and you don't provide anything else, you do no practice, no drills, no whatever, mm -hmm. kids don't retain anything. It's terrible. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, but when it's bolstered by direct instruction, it can be really effective. Um, and I also like what Matt's talking about in variety because from my observations, um, there really are different critical thinking skills that get taught in different approaches. I mean, it, <sighs> In even like the most stodgy, traditional, direct instruction type classroom nowadays, like you're not going to get a Prussian type model, right? Like the teacher doesn't just stand and talk for 50 minutes and then the, kid, the bell rings and the kids leave. Like every lecture I've ever seen, even from really traditional teachers, is interactive. The teacher puts up like half the problem and then stops and then like waits for input or says like, hey, like Johnny, thoughts. What so it's not think? like an Indiana Jones where um, <laughs> Professor Jones just lectures for 50 minutes and then one of the students closes their eyes and says, I love you. <laughs> it's not like that, the, no. Teachers, teachers like to hear themselves talk, but we are not all blessed with the immense ego of Harrison Ford. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice because then criticism wouldn't affect me. But anyway. Um, <laughs> So yeah. I guess that, that actually uh, steers into another question that I'd love to ask myself, uh, is what is the most effective, in your experience, uh, teaching style for your specific field? Oh, uh, I'll just jump in real quick and say all of the above. I mean, <laughs> okay. um, I, I, like, 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 like Hannah just said, I mean, there are times I do straight lecture, but with, with, with dialogue back and forth, you know, Socratic dialogue back and forth because, you know, who the hell wants to listen to me talk for 50 minutes at a stretch? No one. Um, <laughs> I'll blame them. Uh, but, I've been, at, I've know, been at Chicago Skeptic Camp. I was listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was only 15 minutes. Right? Ah, 15, one five, I not think I just yeah. felt like <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, yeah, yeah. But, the, but, you know, then, then there's you know, you break them up into lab work, you sometimes do drills, you sometimes do this inquiry stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I say, you know, do all of the above. And, and, and part of this, too, is, is, I'll just admit it straight up, part of it's purely selfish on my part. Because if I, if I personally, as an educator, if I went into my classroom and I did the same damn thing every single day, I don't think I'd last long. <laughs> I think, I think if, if I had to, you know, just do straight lecture every single day for, you know, 180 days, I think I'd lose my mind. <laughs> I mean, let's be, let's be real, it's, it's, it's beneficial for, for, for me, too. Uh, so that's how I look at it. So variety is the spice of, of the teacher's life. Well, for yeah, some people, so <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Dan. Oh, right, so, so a lot of what I actually do is just straight lecture. Um, so I, <laughs> I guess I'm more traditional in that respect. But I, uh, but even there, I mean, it's like Hannah said. Like I, you know, I pause frequently throughout the lecture to ask the question questions and encourage them to debate with each other back and forth. Even mm -hmm. though I am lecturing for most of the time. Um. Yeah, I think variety is important. But if I'm if I'm going to actually answer the question, um, I read a really powerful piece a little while ago that went around the internet, which is a teacher, a veteran teacher of 20 or 30 or 40 years who shadowed a couple high school students to kind of really put herself in their shoes and like what it's like to, to walk around. Um, and one of the things she noted is like just how much of sitting silently you do. Um, and the way that that changed her classroom was that she started setting a timer for herself. So she never spoke for more than like five or seven minutes at a time. Mm. Um, like whatever she had to say, she was going to shut up and like let the kids do it. Um, 
And so I think my most successful classes have had me sort of direct instructioning for like a couple, for 10 or 15 minutes, and then like throwing a problem or topic on the board and telling them to get to it, and then walking around and getting to kind of explore the weak and strong spots of each student when they call me over and I say like, why does this work? Why does this make sense? Let's go over. And sometimes I reteach it just for that student. I'm blessed, of course, with small classrooms. I teach at a private school. Um, but that balance, and then bringing everyone together and talking and distilling everything everyone said and then talking some more and then throwing it back to them. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think you have a really... One of the things I hear coming out there is that, uh, you know, as a high school student, you're sort of locked in this place for, like, long periods of the day and, like, you know, you, it's... None of it's of your own free will, really. I mean, a lot of it is just sort of forced to do by parents or whoever else or societal expectations. Uh, teaching in the college environment, you know, I teach twice a week. So they see me uh, for about two hours each week. And that's it. And otherwise, they're on, their home, they're on their own doing whatever it is they're doing. Uh, so I think that, um, I suspect that that experience of having a lot of quiet time or listening to a lot of lecture is remarkably different between um, either high school and college. Yeah, I, I have to agree. Because I have a foot in each world. I, I, I teach both high school and college level. And um, I think one of the things we need to bear in mind when we're, you know, we're discussing the issues like this is that there are, there are uh, structural differences, not only in you know, how things are done from, say, a philosophy course to a physics course or a mathematics course or a literature course or, or what have you, just by the nature of the subject matter, right? So they're, 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 that's one thing. Um, and how you can or cannot approach it, depending on what it is you're teaching. But there's also structural differences in, you know, say, high school versus college. Uh, as, as Dan says, the students are expected to be more independent. Um, and so that, that will kind of influence things versus at the high school level. Um, you know, you, you do have more face time with your students at the high school level. You know, in most high schools, or in many high schools at least, at least the one where I teach, you know, you see them pretty much five days a week for almost an hour a day. Uh, and so that kind of structure allows you to uh, set up a different kind of learning environment than, say, what you know Dan's dealing with, where you see your students only for an hour or twice a week. And then the rest of the time, they basically have to, you know, do the reading on their own and so on and so forth. So you, you have you have to work with what you've got, basically. Um, and right. but within that for, within that particular structure that you have and have, you know, uh, you still have a lot of options. Like, like like Dan said, I mean, you know, Dan, you're not you're not just doing straight lecture for an hour. You're you're mixing it up. You're getting them involved and everything. So. There are, there are a lot of tools in the toolkit that the educator has uh, they can use. Um, there's another question from the chat channel. Um, it goes, mm. my wife and I have been considering writing a book for young children to teach them a little bit about critical thinking by explaining some logical fallacies without using the actual terms. Um, do you folks think it's doable? And how old do you think the kids would have to be to be able to process the information? Ooh. It's kind of a dense, dense question. There's a lot to unpack there, um, partly because I think that most kids can get anything that you give them in language that they understand. But well, let me take a look at One thing that springs to my mind is that uh, kids are actually, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm nowhere near an expert on elementary school education or anything like that, uh, to take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt, but it seems to me that kids are actually capable of doing some um, fairly sophisticated moral evaluations uh, in the sense that, we, you know, you can say things to kids like, well, how would you like it if someone did that to you? Um, it seems Assuming to me that... A functioning sense of empathy, of course. Well, right. I mean, yes. you know, so, but most, most kids do. Uh, and even if they don't, you can say something like, well, how do you think people would respond to you if you did something like that? Uh, so even if you don't have empathy, it seems like there might be some pragmatic reasons 
to avoid certain kinds of behaviors. I think the same sort of thing is true when we talk about uh, when we talk about reasoning, that much of what we're talking about when we talk about critical thinking is norms on our reasoning, right? So kinds of reasoning that we should do or kinds of reasoning we should not do. And in that sense, it kind of parallels how we reason about morality. So I think, um, and, you know, you could say much of many of the same things, right? Like, what do you think would happen if we went around thinking that sort of way as opposed to this other sort of way? Um, yeah, okay, I guess... I... Oh, please. Go on. Number um, one. Yeah, I guess I want to start by saying, like, I think as an educator, but also as a person, and also as someone who thinks it's important to teach critical thinking, it's morally crucial that I do not underestimate the intelligence and thinking capacity of people under the age of 18. Like, I have tremendous respect for teenagers and teenagers and every, <laughs> like it's just, I just don't think you get anywhere by thinking of young people as, as, as incapable of doing the same thinking that you're doing. Um, uh, for, whatever, for whatever developmental differences there are um, that you want to be aware of and speak uh, in a way that they can understand, like underestimation is just going to undermine your goal. I mean, yada yada, overestimation will too, but, but, but start, start from a place of respect for people you're trying to teach critical thinking to. Um, and, and I guess the second point is, just as a practical uh, suggestion, is I always like to show, I mean, this is what the other questioner was, asked, was, was telling us, right? Like, do you make students argue for things that are wrong? Well, they should also encounter arguments they think are wrong. They should encounter fallacious arguments. And <laughs> there is no shortage to be found um, to have a great conversation about. I've seen some yeah, that's a, smart that's a very interesting point. But I guess go ahead, Matt. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, to detail on something that Hannah just said about you know not underestimating um, you know children and whatnot. I mean, let's stop and think about it. I mean, by the time kids are twelve years old, how many of them still believe in Santa Claus? <laughs> right, versus when they're say six. And I mean, at least in my case, and in the case of uh, my brother and sister and, and almost everybody I know, uh, it's not like the parents came out one day and said, well, you know, we've been, we've been kind of deceiving you. You know, this whole Santa thing is real. Uh, kids kind of figure that out on their own. I mean, so, so I think that's a great, you know, the, the whole, you know, non-reality of Santa, I, I think that's a great sort of way of, of looking at this because it, it's it, it's sort of a little myth, a story that the kids are told and, and, and of course society reinforces it and everything. But by the time they're 12, 13, by the time they get that age, they've pretty much figured it out uh, one way or another that, uh, well, yeah, it's it's not real. It's just this kind of little fantasy that we all that we all enjoy. Uh, and, um, you know, same for the Easter Bunny and Tooth Fairy and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I think that things like that are actually constructive for kids. I think it's very good that um, that that kids can figure that sort of thing out on their own, and that they do. Now, of course, I mean, you have run into the occasional kid that has, you know, maybe they're fourteen and they still believe in Santa. Uh, yeah, but not many. So, um, but. Uh, but for the most part, they do figure it out, and 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 so I don't know. I like I like to use examples like that as sort of a, a template for helping kids to think critically. So that would be, so to whoever is planning on maybe writing this book, that's that would be my advice to you. you know, well, if you're so doing one thing to that one thing that sort of occurred to me while I was listening to the other panelists talk about this. Um, so there's two stories. Two stories that my parents read to me when I was a kid. Uh, one was uh, the cat in the hat, and the other was uh, the man who never does his dishes. Um, now, both of those are about decisions that people make that then turn out to have really grave results. Um, you know, if you never do your dishes, they like they pile up in the kitchen, and everything's a mess, and it's horrible. And kids are capable of understanding 
those sorts of consequences. So it seems to me that um, if you're presenting them with logical fallacies, uh, a way to do that would be is, is through a narrative like that. Um, yeah. You know, that, you know, uh, Bob trusts every authority that ever tells him anything, and then he goes around believing all kinds of things and gets in all kinds of trouble and so on. Okay, um, we don't have a lot of time left. We're coming up on the end of the panel. Uh, I have one last question from the audience. Uh, when I teach critical thinking, my problem is finding examples to teach the skills with, which are not religion or standard pseudoscience stuff. Uh, do you have ideas of good case examples to use, problems to think through that aren't in those two areas or in abstract philosophy? That's a great question. Um, we on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like to okay, and and they're, they're, they want examples that aren't sort of standard pseudoscience. Is that what yeah. did I hear that right? Yeah. Try to avoid um, anything that's going to be particularly uh, problematic for an audience that might be potentially hostile. I guess. Um. Well, I'll give you an example of something that I do. I mean, I actually. In, the, in my class, I actually have a lot of pseudoscience that I tackle, but I do it in kind of a sneaky way, because since I teach physics, I kind of can talk about the physics and then say, oh, but there are these other people that say this and so on and so forth. But if we're trying to avoid, you know, explicitly pseudoscientific type of uh, type of type of scenarios, uh, I'll give you an example of one thing. Um, like when I teach about um, when I teach about uh, the law of inertia. Uh, I actually use a historical example um, because Galileo was one of the people who really helped to formulate the whole concept of inertia and so on and so forth. And Galileo was a heliocentrist you know, uh, back in back in his time in the early 1600s and so so on. Uh, the prevailing view in in Western civilization was geocentrism. The Earth is at the center of the uh, solar system. Um, now Galileo comes along and he's a heliocentrist and. and for various reasons and so on. He believes the sun is at the center. And he wants to argue that the sun's at the center. And then you get a situation where there's a there's an argument, right? And and one of the arguments that was against the idea of a uh, sun centered is that the earth would have to move, and if the earth has to move, then the argument went, well, if you take an object like this ball and then you drop it as the earth is moving at you know, 20 miles per second or so on and so forth, there's no way the ball should drop straight down. It should you know, slam against the wall because the entire Earth and everything is moving at 20 miles per second this way. Um, and then I like to present that question to my students and, and, and say, okay, well, if you were Galileo, how might you respond to this? You know, this is, and then put them in a position where they have to argue that out. Um, now, that's not an explicitly pseudoscientific situation, but uh, well, depending upon where you are, because there actually are geocentrists now who are holding conferences and stuff. But it's not it's not one that people generally think about uh, in that sense. But it is uh, it's it's an interesting way of kind of building that scenario where kind of like what I said earlier in in the panel, where you kind of give them a flawed argument and see if they can figure out what the problem with the argument is and, and, and talk that out. That, that's, that's maybe one example uh, of, and I hope that answers the question. I'm, I'm very sorry if it doesn't, but I, I, I think that's maybe what they were getting at. So that's, yeah. that's it's not very pseudoscientific to, uh, well, I suppose it is. Uh, at the time, it was pseudoscience. So well, at the, at the time it was well, actually at the time it was the prevailing worldview. I mean, at the time yeah. it was considered science. I mean, most astronomers and scientists said, "Yeah, the Earth's at the center." Uh, why wouldn't it be? I mean, so so at the time it, it, it was the prevailing view, and Galileo yeah. was the rebel. Yeah, I really really love the idea of using historical examples. Um, I think it was um, Scott of of Slate Star Codex who wrote a really great piece about reading philosophy backwards, that reading philosophy is an exercise in seeing like what wasn't obvious to people. Like when when people read not to tread on Dan's turf here, but when people read Locke now, they're like, yeah, of course we should have a social contract in the government. But like the reason he wrote that is because he was arguing with people who disagreed <laughs> with him. 
Um, because that didn't exist. <laughs> right. So there's, all, there's tons of examples from physics which are really great. I mean, like, depending on how niche you want to get, but the difference between, like, Newtonian and relativistic physics, um, right. even the list, the list goes on and on. Um, but you can really use anything, any historical argument to discuss what assumptions people had and what people thought would happen um, and talk about like whether their predictions were were right or wrong. Um, the 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 math specific examples that, that I like are um, there's a there's a video online called why all triangles are equilateral, like why all triangles have the same number of or have three equal sides, um, which of course is not true. Um, but like the goal is find the error. And there's all kinds of proofs of like one equals two that are the same idea, and they're pretty they're pretty math specific, but it's still reasoning of of okay this thing has to be wrong, but I can't find the error in the reasoning. Well, gotta find it. Um, my favorite, and I will leave this for the audience. Um, induction is a type of proof where I basically prove that something's true for like base case, and then I say if it's true for anything, it's true for the next one. And if I can prove both of those things, then I've proved it for everything ever. And so the case goes like, the proof goes like this. Ready? Any horse is the same color as itself. Everyone with me? Yeah? <laughs> Everyone agree so far? Every horse is the same color as a Great. Now imagine like, doesn't matter, like 10 horses. Right? If, and I'm not saying they are, but if all 10 horses were the same color, any group of 10 horses was the same color as each other, well then if you had an 11th horse, you could think of like a group of 10 that included that 11th horse. And then they all have to be the same color. So now the 11th horse also has to be the same color. So now I've proven that one horse is the same color as itself, and if you have any number of horses, the next number is also going to be the same color, which means all horses are the same color. <laughs> and I will leave you with that. And I'm not going to give you the so answer. You have to think about it yourself. That sounds so much like the classical uh, question from philosophy, you know, all swans are white. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes, it's exactly the same thing. That's good, that's good. Well, assuming a spherical horse. Right. Yes. <laughs> the answer is committed to hanamessinger.com uh, for, for, for extra credit. I wonder huh. if any of my students are just about out of time. Probably not. <laughs> we are just about out of time. If you guys want to give your, uh, your last plugs, last thoughts, by all means. Okay. Let's start with Matt. You're the sure, only one I'll go. Um, I would just say, um, you know, a lot of it goes back to what we were talking about in the very beginning. Um, it, it's for me, a, a lot of this uh, education business that I'm in is not so much what to teach, not 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 so much teaching kids what to think, but how to think. Um, because I'm not going to fool myself into thinking that if I happen to run into one of my random students who graduated 10 years from now on the street, and I walk up to them and I say, you know, hey, Joey or, or, or Sam or Sandy, how about that Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, and then expect that they can, you know, quote the formula to me. Right. I'm not going to fool myself into thinking that. Unless, of course, they're a physics major or an astronomer, in which case they better damn well be able to. Um, <laughs> But I would still, uh, but I, I, but I would hope that if I see my student ten or fifteen years from now, that they would remember that, for example, they they, they watched me do a demonstration where I walked barefoot on broken glass shards and I didn't get cut, that they would be able to reason through that. The reason why that happens doesn't have anything to do with mysticism or mind over matter, but what it really has to do with is the, the simple physics of pressure. Um, and um, and I actually have had that encounter where I've seen students 10, 15 years after the fact, and they've come back and said, "Yeah, I remember when you did that demo." And I just never, I just never, they, you know, they never forget stuff like that. You know, they forget the formula for Newton's law of gravitation, but they don't forget that sort of thing. And and again, that gets back to, for me, it gets back to that idea of planting that seed of doubt, planting that seed of you know, getting them to think about things a little bit more. And uh, and if and if I can do that, then uh, you know I feel like at the end of the day I've I've, I've done what I set out to do. 
I'm not sure what's happening with your audio, but that is completely unintelligible. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm here on now. Computer now. Uh, I hear you three it's times. <laughs> it's, 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 is this good? Is this good? I'm afraid no. not. No, it's uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let someone else speak then. Okay, we'll make sure that you get proper, properly plugged after the panel. I'm very sorry. Hana. Yeah, I'll just I'll just go one step more meta than Matt um, and say that um, one of the most striking things that I find in my classroom is when I explain the reasoning behind something that this some equation or formula that the students have memorized and they they are not shocked at what it is they are shocked that there is one um, and if I meet a student ten or fifteen years hence I hope that even more than the formulas or even more than mathematical reasoning which I hope they remember like. They will expect that in the world there are reasons for things and that they are owed those reasons, that they don't have to take anything just because somebody said so, but that they, um, they deserve the attention and care of someone bothering to spend the time to tell them why it is, because why matters. That is That's a good point. great note to end this on. Uh, so I have to stop the broadcast now. We are running out of time. Thank you very much for organizing this panel, Hana. Thank you for moderating. Hey, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Matt. You guys have a good day. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you.